The U.S. Forest Service is arguably the most influential federal agency in the state. A little over 20 million acres, or 38% of Idaho, is managed by the Forest Service. So we gathered together some of their leaders, including the former chief, to look back on the agency they've devoted their lives to. Initially, the agency was created to provide clean water and a sustainable flow of timber. It was always this concept to be able to manage these lands, basically to protect them. And back then, the Forest Service was the white hat agency. I'm old enough to remember Lassie. And what was the Ranger Rick, you know? We were on TV and it was like the Ranger was the hero and, and of course Lassie was a big part of it. It was definitely a white hat agency. And right after World War II, there was a need to put out a lot of timber lumber to actually build a lot of the homes that were needed at that time. We look back on it today and we would have done things a little different. There's no doubt clear cutting is the least cost way to harvest timber off a landscape. But there's trade-offs, uh, big time. So yeah, that's the period of time when, you know, we were arrogant, no doubt about it. The pendulum swung over kind of on the industrial side. And we're responsible for cutting on the national forests in places that we should have never cut and it just can't support that kind of forestry. We kind of paid for that in the end. We were listening more to the industry as opposed to the broader ecosystem sort of approach. At the same time, there was a lot of political pressure. Oh yeah, there was. Be doing that. I look back on those times and I think we learned a lot. And I wish we could have learned a little faster and a little sooner we tended to think of ourselves as the experts on everything. We would ask for public input and then we'd put it away in a tidy little file and we would go on with what we wanted to do. We seem to be 10 years behind as we're trying to put into practice collaboration. Is it beefed up public involvement that we really mm. just use as an opportunity to tell people why they were wrong? <laughs> or is it truly, you look at the definition and it's, <laughs> creating something together. I think that multiple use provides a really excellent tool for us to stay engaged with the public and bring them to the table to figure out how they see their lands being used. As our country is changing so rapidly and becoming so much more diverse, that is going to be critical. We were taking on this controversy, and Jim was part of it, to deal with the roadless areas in Idaho. It's like nine million acres, a big chunk of national forest. And when we started that, I thought there was no way we were gonna come up with anything where there would be agreement. And I saw how you were able to bring people together in a way and allow them to really share their thinking. You didn't challenge a person's values, you listened to them. And what came out of that was an agreement where the administration, the governors, and the communities bought off on it. And that was my first true experience with collaboration. I'm still somewhat in amazement that we were able to do that. As far as I know, and these guys can correct me, but it's still working in this state. That's one of the things I really like about this organization is the learning culture. We understand that we make mistakes. We're trying to learn from that. On climate change, we have longer fire seasons, they're hotter and drier. And our scientists would say, they're 78 days longer because we have the research and here's the data to show it. And that's all been driven just by climate change. There's still this expectation that we can suppress every fire. It's not gonna happen, it never has and never will. When we get these large fires, the science is very clear. No amount of suppression is going to change the overall size of that fire. When it comes to point protection, to be able to protect communities and homes and that sort of thing, we do a tremendous job. But the science will show the size of those large fires is basically the same whether we were there or not. When I think about how hard everyone is working out there on the lines and I'd hear this criticism, I'd get really defensive. As the cost of fires went up every year, we had to take money out of all the other programs to be able to pay for fire suppression. 50% less foresters, 50% less engineers, 50% less wildlife biologists, fisheries biologists, 60% less archeologists. And it's 
really had an impact on the agency's ability to provide the level of care and service that the public demands and should expect. What I've seen come from that, though, is more ownership from the public. When they finally realize that you don't have the workforce, I've seen more and more volunteers and people, groups that want to come out, and then they take more ownership in it. And I think that's been something that's really neat about the public, stepping up and taking more ownership in that. Where people feel that they're actually part of what goes on under National Forest, I think it helps to maintain that. When I look at where the agency is today and how it's reflected with the folks that are sitting up here with me today, we're in a much better place today than we've ever been. And I'm just very confident that the agency will be there to provide what this country needs as we go forward.